I'll just say at the start, um, those of you who have had anything to do with, or in fact have been to the Bradford Department of Peace Studies, we've actually made it to 40 years this year. Um, it's been through some interesting times recently, now recovering. Uh, and if anybody's interested, I've got a few copies of uh, a new report which basically describes the history of the department and very much what it is doing now. So anybody who's interested, please take one of those. I'll leave a little pile here. Um, when you use the term security by remote control, people immediately think armed drones. And while that's a very large part of it, what I'd like to try, if I can, this evening is to sort of put it in a rather wider perspective. Uh, we've got about an hour, so I'll only talk for about uh, 35 minutes, so we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, because uh, what I'm interested in is something which deals very much more widely than just armed drones. Um, Trying to think where a good starting point would be. I think if we go back, what are we, 2004, go back um, 21 years to, I think it was February 1993. Uh, Bill Clinton had come in as the new president. He'd won the election in November 92. And during the transition period, he formed his new core group. And one of the people who had to appoint was the new director for central intelligence, head of the CIA. Um, he picked a guy called James Woolsey, a um, Republican as it happened, but uh, uh, an experienced intelligence professional. And as is the system in the US, there had to be approval given by one of the relevant Senate committees. And one of the senators asked Woolsey, he said, look, uh, Mr. Woolsey, the Cold War is over. How would, would you characterize the changing international security environment? And Woolsey said to him, well, I would look at it this way, Senator, um, we've slain the dragon, but we now live in a jungle inhabited by poisonous snakes. In other words, the Soviet Union gone, but there are different threats uh, for which the United States was not quite sure and wasn't necessarily prepared. And he took this view, and in some ways this is illustrative of the changing in the US military posture during the course of the 1990s. Before I go on, I'm going to speak loud enough for people at the back. It's okay, right. If my voice goes down for any reason, then just, uh, just remind me. Um, during the course of the 1990s, the United States military posture has changed a great deal, moving away from the kinds of forces that had evolved for the, the Cold War dynamics against the Soviet bloc. Uh, so you had really quite a scaling down on the nuclear side, nothing like complete and not all of it by negotiation, but a fairly serious scaling down. Other areas like anti-submarine warfare were cut back very heavily. And you also had a cutback in the army, particularly the heavy armor side. In other words, those things which were really associated at core with the Cold War confrontation were cut back quite a lot. And in overall terms, the defense budget went down to some extent. Not hugely, but to some extent. It didn't go down anything like as much as it did in the old Soviet bloc countries, particularly in Russia, where the economic collapse as it uh, embraced turbo capitalism was so severe that the armed forces went into quite considerable disarray. But for the Americans, while they did this scaling back, a number of aspects of the military posture stayed more or less at the, at the, the then level, and in fact, some were enhanced. So the Marine Corps uh, lost virtually none of its personnel. And remember, the Marine Corps then, as now, has about 180,000 personnel. That's about twice the size of the entire current British Army. And that's very much the expeditionary wing of the US Armed Forces. Um, the Navy kept, I think, 11 out of its 14 carrier battle groups. So its ability to project power by a combination of carrier air power, cruise missiles, missiles and the rest, was very largely maintained. Uh, the Army tended to put more effort into its special forces, and the Air Force tended to put more effort into long-range strike. So basically, it was a kind of reconfiguring during the course of the 1990s, uh, directed towards, put it very crudely, taming the jungle, not slaying the dragon. By the end of the 1990s, of course, you had another movement within American politics. You had the rise of what you might call the neoconservatives and the associative realists, particularly on the Republican side. And when George W. Bush won the election in November 2000, eventually, when the decision over the Florida Chads had gone to the Supreme Court, he came in very much along the lines of looking for the new American century. The project for the new American century really looked towards a future in which the world would benefit from civilized peace, which would essentially be rooted in the free market, the liberal democracy of the US form. And Bush coming in in uh, 2001, forming his own team, 
put in the Pentagon, uh, Donald Rumsfeld with his deputy Paul Wolfowitz. And in many ways, Rumsfeld embraced this view of scaling down the military, and the term used in Washington at that time was war light. In other words, you have very powerful forces, very high tech, but they're the forces which are able to keep things under control without actually putting thousands and thousands of boots on the ground. And that was very much the kind of outlook in the very early part of the 2000s. But it was very clear that Rumsfeld embraced the idea of the new American century very strongly, more of an assertive realist than a neoconservative, but very much this was what he saw as the way forward. And in some ways, when the 9-11 atrocities happened, if you actually looked at how the United States reacted, it was really along the lines of war lights. Uh, there's no doubt that the Al-Qaeda movement itself wanted to encourage the Frankfurt cell to carry out the 9-11 attack for two reasons. One was to demonstrate to the wider Umar, the Muslim world, the capacity of the movement, this small movement, but able to hit at the far enemy in this way. But the second aim, undoubtedly, was actually to draw the Americans into some sort of occupation of Afghanistan. Remember, there was a long um, legacy, almost, for the, for the Al-Qaeda movement, right back to the Mujahideen in the 1980s. And the view within the Al-Qaeda movement was that they had helped the Mujahideen defeat the Soviet Union, and therefore brought about the demise of the Soviet Union itself. Now, that's a huge exaggeration, although the problems in Afghanistan were part of the problems that Gorbachev faced. But nevertheless, from an Al-Qaeda perspective, if you've actually worn down a superpower, why can you not do it again with the United States? And from the perspective of their, their own planners, it seemed a very workable idea for a very practical logistic reason. If you conduct this tremendous attack against the United States, expecting that any administration, certainly the Bush administration, will react very strongly, then to actually dis dismantle the Taliban regime in Afghanistan could not be done quickly. Winter was coming on, it would take months to get a reinforced, maybe two reinforced divisions to occupy the country. So there seemed to be time on the Taliban come al Qaeda side, but there wasn't. Because what the United States did was a combination of very heavy aerial bombing, use of special forces in the CIA, and especially uh, using the Northern Alliance, remember this is towards the end of the Afghan Civil War, as the kind of ground troops. Uh, rearming and resupplying them, ironically, from Ukraine and Russia, but actually paid for by the United States. And the Taliban were, done, were gone in about 10 weeks. Melted away, though, rather than actually completely defeated in the conventional sense. And the Al-Qaeda movement was already pretty dispersed. One could hardly really describe it as a movement even then, though, because in the years following 9-11, you actually had all kinds of loosely affiliated groups in different parts of the world very active. You look at all the different Al-Qaeda type actions that you had in Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, Kenya, um, Turkey obviously, Indonesia, uh, Britain, Spain and elsewhere. Uh, the Al-Qaeda movement was really not a narrow cohesive hierarchical movement. But as far as the United States was concerned, uh, they got rid of the Taliban and dispersed Al-Qaeda, so to some extent they were at least part of the way there. You know, you have that extraordinary State of the Union address by George Bush in January 2002, when the idea of the war on terror against the Al-Qaeda movement was extended to this much wider idea of seeing down an axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, and uh, North Korea, who presented threats to the United States. Uh, the view was that they harbored terrorist movements and they were looking for weapons of mass destruction. And then there followed, in uh, March 2003, uh, the termination of the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq. And this leads up to what, nearly 11 years ago, Bush's speech on the deck of the Abraham Lincoln, 1st of May 2003, when from his perspective, the atrocities of 9-11 had been turned around. You actually had the Taliban gone, the Al-Qaeda movement dis displaced, and really a shadow of itself, and Iraq now coming under Western control. It even meant that Iran itself would not be a threat because it had Western bases in Afghanistan to the east, to the west in Iraq, um, allied states to the west down the Western Gulf, and the Fifth Fleet reconstituted, uh, providing security in the Arabian Sea and to an extent to the Persian Gulf. So it looked like everything was going to extent right. And it's worth also remembering that the uh, operations in Iraq, uh, March, April 2003, 
were not that far from war light. The Americans and their uh, coalition partners, including the British, only put about 60,000 ground troops into Iraq. Now, compared with the 600,000 troops that had been assembled 20 so year, what, 12 years earlier to get the Iraqis out of Kuwait, and you can see the use of air power in 2003. Mm. So, May 2003, it looked like war light along this model was working and working as expected. By this time, we were already into the era of some new advances, not things utterly new, but rather new advances in what we now term armed drones. And the two countries who have been working on this very heavily in the preceding five to ten years were the United States and, of course, Israel, the countries that had really gone into the armed drone idea at a very early stage. Many other drones were, of course, available for reconnaissance and other purposes. So essentially, you had, by 2003, a belief that this variant of war light worked and there were new technologies coming on as well. What happened instead was that, to put it very bluntly, war light in Iraq and Afghanistan became war heavy in both cases. Uh, there isn't time to go into all the detail of what happened, but essentially in Afghanistan, you actually had the neglect of the security of the Afghans themselves. Um, you know, from December 2001, Afghanistan was largely left to its own devices, and there was a security vacuum almost immediately. At that time, there were some very sharp Afghan analysts and some UN people saying that what Afghanistan needed after all these years of conflict was a real stabilization process so that it itself could develop its own security and rebuild its civil infrastructure. Lakhta Brahimi, uh, one of the best diplomats going, very experienced UN person, trying currently uh, to get something to happen in Syria. Lata Brahim, who was the UN point person in Afghanistan at the time, and he was saying, look, you needed something like 30,000 peacekeeping troops to help stabilize the country very quickly, preferably many of them from Muslim countries. Uh, but the Americans were already um, almost completely immersed in the coming war with Iraq. Well, they were not really interested in Afghanistan. They had the 10th Mountain Division fighting a rather bitter small war in the southeast of the country. But for the rest of it, the United States was preoccupied with developing the capacity to uh, terminate the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq. The Europeans were expected by the Americans to fill the gap, but didn't. Uh, the British, the French, the Germans, and the rest did not. There was a NATO force set up, the International Security Assistance Force, but within a year or so, by late 2002, there were just 5,000 troops assigned to it. Nothing like enough, except to provide some degree of, quotes, protection in Kabul and maybe Herat and Mazar Sharif and a few other cities. And this meant that within two or three years, elements of the Taliban and other armed opposition groups were back. And by 2006, ISAF was slowly building up its forces. It was in the spring of 2006 the British started the process, which ended up eventually with them having nearly 10,000 troops in Helman province. <coughs> Going right through, by what, three years ago, there were now 140,000 foreign troops in Afghanistan. War light had become more heavy, and it was becoming a huge problem for what was by then the new administration of Barack Obama. But in Afghanistan was problematic. It was as nothing compared with what had happened in Iraq. And within, what, three or four months of the start of the termination of the Saddam Hussein regime, it was blatantly obvious that what was developing was an all-out, very bitter, urban insurgency against occupation. It morphed in the next year or two into a very complex uh, conflict involving much interconfessional violence. But it started with opposition to the United States and its coalition partners. And during the course of 2003, this developed very rapidly. The Americans realized they had a huge problem on their hands. Uh, they turned at a fairly early stage to India to provide an additional reinforced division. But the Indians under Vajpayee were willing to do it politically, but the Indian population would not go along with it. And since that government was facing a general election the next year, the Indians refused. So from late 2003 onwards, it became essentially an American war. The only other major state participating was Britain. It became extremely bitter and it could be portrayed by Islamist propagandists as clear evidence of a crusader plot to take over, not Afghanistan, but a heartland country in the Arab Muslim world. 
And they were aided in this by this extraordinary development, completely understandable from an American perspective, of the Americans looking for allies who could at least advise them on this kind of urban insurgency. And the one country that knew all about that in the region was, of course, Israel. So you had very close connections developed on top of the existing connections with the Israelis late in 2003. And while this was not widely reported in the Western media, it was very common knowledge across the Middle East and was used brilliantly by Islamist propagandists. They could present a crusader Zionist plot now. And of course, the other issue that was happening was that within Iraq itself, the young American soldiers and Marines were by and large facing an insurgency um, against whom they were not properly trained. They were not trained for that kind of warfare. They believed very largely that what they were fighting were people who would be described as terrorists because they had believed the connection between Iraq and 9-11 itself. And the end result inevitably of this is that when they were facing attacks, they would use their one big advantage, massive firepower, in response. That meant in turn that civilian casualties went up and up. Opposition to the American occupation went up as well. And you had more and more casualties peaking at one stage at the best part of 20,000 civilians killed in one single year. By 2007, 2008, the Americans are trying other methods, including a very major sea uh, surge. But by this time, 2008, the new election campaign was in full swing. And essentially, Obama took the political decision to fight that campaign in relation to military matters on the basis that Iraq was the bad war, and that was one in which the United States had to withdraw. And that was popular within the US by this time. Whereas Afghanistan was, relatively speaking, still a good war because of clearer connection with 9-11. Obama came in and within two years had tried to negotiate an American troop withdrawal from Iraq, leaving behind maybe 10,000 troops to maintain a degree of regional influence. That failed. The Maliki government would have not allow the Americans to stay unless they accepted Iraqi rule of law for their personnel. The United States would not do this, so all the formal combat troops left by the end of 2011. The British had already left by this time. So essentially, the whole idea of really reshaping the Middle East after 9-11 fell apart. And the extraordinary result was that Iran, in fact, ended up even more uh, influential in the Gulf than before. As far as Afghanistan was concerned, Obama came in with this view that essentially the Afghan war had to be ended, but it might be possible to negotiate a way out from a position of strength. And this is why Obama accepted the idea of a surge, which went on in 2010, and so you ended up with 140,000 troops in Afghanistan. Iraq, incidentally, but picked up, uh, had peaked at nearly 180,000. The tactic in Afghanistan of trying to negotiate for a position of strength itself failed, and the United States is now withdrawing probably all but maybe 10,000 troops by the end of this year, and Britain has already withdrawn 40% of its, and almost all the British troops will be out at the end of this year. So in a sense, you are left with a situation in which war light became war heavy in two huge theatres of war, huge numbers of boots on the ground did not work. As this was taking place, in parallel, other ideas were developing. Now, I want to be absolutely clear, these are not ideas which are absolutely new. Many of them hark back even to the Cold War. But what has happened really is a move away from the idea of control by very strong forces overseas, if you like, to put it crudely, stamping on the jungle, to much more seal activity using new technologies and new enhanced methods. Um, they do include much greater reliance on armed drones, and they were used very extensively in uh, Pakistan, not so much now, but they've been used in a number of, of other countries as well. Uh, the Israelis, of course, meanwhile, have been using them repeatedly in the occupied territories, and also in Lebanon on occasions. But for the United States, the major areas have been Southwest Asia, and uh, the main weapons used had been first the Predator and then the hugely more powerful Reaper, each of which are equipped to fire Hellfire missiles, which themselves are very powerful and extremely accurate. The extent to which these have been used is quite considerable. We're talking about the low hundreds in places like Pakistan, but within Afghanistan it's of an altogether different magnitude. 
Real figures are difficult to come by, but the suspicion is the United States must now be heading towards maybe 1,600 to 2,000 armed strikes with uh, Reapers in Afghanistan alone. Uh, Britain bought into this about five years ago, and it got its first five-strong squadron of Reapers. I think they went operational about four years ago. Uh, the system with the Reapers is that they are normally flown out of a base in Afghanistan, most commonly Kandahar, so there's a ground crew there. But the, uh, the weapons themselves, the, the armed drones themselves, <coughs> were operated until recently by RAF personnel operating at Creech Air Force Base, which is about, I think, 40 miles northwest of Las Vegas in Nevada. So they operate in real time from there, and each drone will have two or sometimes three personnel running it, a sort of pilot, navigator, and weapons operator. And essentially, they have a very long loiter time. They're very accurate. And they can be used with just a couple of them over a long period of time. Uh, Britain, to at least as far as we know from many public information, has not used armed drones in Pakistan. Uh, but as of last year, it had done about 350 armed raids in, in Afghanistan itself. And virtually no information available from Britain as to the casualties. It's almost impossible to get any information out of the Ministry of Defense on this. Journalists do it separately, but it's very difficult to do. Now, that's not entirely unexpected. Um, if you remember, for about six months, the Royal Air Force was involved a couple of years ago in the campaign to get rid of Gaddafi in Libya. Um, I'd done a fair bit of work, including being involved in some studies uh, about changes in British defense policy, which involved some meetings at the Ministry of Defense. And quite by chance, I happened to be on the mailing list for the routine press reports that the ministry sent to all the major media. These are not classified, but I happened to be on the mailing list. In fact, I still am. And the interesting thing was that almost every other day, you would get reports from the Ministry of Defense to journalists across the media saying what the activities of the RF had been in the previous 48 hours. And they would say, for example, that this uh, multiple rocket launcher had been destroyed. Uh, this psychological operations warfare center had been hit. These tank transporters had been hit. So it was a record of the raids that the RF conducted. There was never any mention about anybody getting killed or injured. None at all. Uh, it was almost as though, you know, the, the Libyan ordinary soldiers were so bright they knew a raid was going to happen 10 minutes ahead of time and got out of the way, but there was nobody there. Uh, it's just mythical, but I'm afraid we know so little uh, from the perception of the, the ministries themselves, whether in Britain or the Pentagon or elsewhere. But essentially, the armed drones are, in a sense, one part of it. Incidentally, the Royal Air Force is now getting a second squadron, their rather enhanced version, and the operations have moved from Creech Air Force Base to RAF Waddington, just south of Lincolnshire, which houses Lincoln, which houses the RAF Air Warfare Center. So the British drones in Afghanistan still use regularly are flown, so to speak, in inverted commas, from Waddington up near Lincoln. As far as the United States is concerned, uh, the Reaper represents the current main armed drone, but there are many others in, under development. But I said at the start, this is in a sense only part of the story. The other major developments have been a huge expansion in the use of special forces. Uh, quite extraordinary. It's not been great in Britain, and it's very difficult to get information about how large the SAS is now compared with 10 years ago. We do know that eight years ago, the Ministry of Defense established an adjunct to the SAS called the Special Forces Support Group. And this is sort of elite people picked from other regiments who actually provide the logistic support, forward-based logistic support, uh, for SAS and SBS operations. Um, they include people drawn from, I think it's two power, the RAF Regiment and 40 Commando, who spent fairly short times, maybe two years at a time, uh, actually um, sent to the uh, Special Forces Support Group. In the United States, it's at a very different level. All four branches of the US military, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and now the Marines too, have major Special Forces operations. And they come together to an extent in US Special Operations Command, which is a semi-unified command for the whole world. And the numbers in that, I think about four years ago, were about 45,000. I can't remember the exact figures. About 45,000 Special Forces alone. That is currently over 60,000. And will peak, I think, at the end of next year, 2015, at about 72,000. So the US Special Forces 
At the end of next year, will be roughly the same size, almost the same size, as the entire British Army as that is scaled down. So we're dealing with a very different level of action. And by and large, special force operations uh, are virtually never covered in the media, at least not as they happen or soon after. Um, there's been no admission at all, for example, that the United States had special forces operating in Mali, just as the French were moving in a year or so ago. It only came out into the open when three special forces personnel in Bamoko were involved in a vehicle crash and all got killed. And only by that means was it even known that US special forces were operating the country. The US had previously denied any military involvement in Mali. Britain also has had special forces there, and of course along with the French too. In fact, it's def difficult to get a complete figure, but probably on the training side, uh, the US has special force units training people in about 140 countries at the present time. All of this is very much below the radar. And then you have the final development, which is the quite rapid expansion of privatized military companies. Privatized military, not privatized security. Privatized security is the general umbrella which covers everything right down to G4S gardening prisoners. Privatized military are companies which are much more combat orientated. Many of them are ex-special forces. Uh, the main recruiting countries have tended to be foreign legionnaires from France, South Africans, Ukraines, Britons, and Americans. So quite a lot of Australians, because the Australia, Australia has a very a small but extremely strong special forces set up. So you have really a combination of armed drones, special forces hugely increased, and privatized military. And all of those areas are far more below the radar in terms of public opinion uh, than is normally appreciated. It's a kind of, if you like, a kind of shadow development. Now, I wouldn't say for a moment this is just limited to the West in any sense at all. Uh, it was recently reported, I think pretty accurately, uh, that the Russians had special forces in Crimea 10 days ago when they were denying any uniformed military involvement in the peninsula at all. Uh, so it, it do not get the impression it is purely Western. But it's certainly been a leading of the way, I think primarily by the United States, not least because of its experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's a combination of technology, new methods, and needs must. But again, it's not that new. If you look at US special force operations in Latin America during the Cold War, or the Russians in Afghanistan in the early years. So it isn't something new, but it's coming to the fore as the alternative. It's the way of keeping control remotely, security by remote control. It raises many issues, and the main one, obviously, is this whole question of accountability. And we can perhaps discuss it and some of the others in a minute, but I'll just point to one or two others as well. The first is, obviously, we're at the stage of a proliferation of an idea. Um, I don't know if any of you know, there's a, a very good little public domain security group called Open Briefing. It's an NGO, and it publishes some very interesting reports on what's happening in the security world. They did a very interesting study a few months ago about the proliferation of armed drones. Who was developing them and at what pace were they developing? You get it on their website, it's www.openbriefing.org. But essentially, some of the things they threw up and have become clear since are that it isn't just the Americans and the Israelis developing and exporting armed drones. Incidentally, the French have recently bought some Reapers, which they are basing in Niger for operations in Northern Africa. No, I mean, other examples very clearly, countries that are now developing armed drones on scale are China, Russia, India, probably Turkey, and certainly Iran as well. The Iranians are very interested in the whole idea of drones. They've really caused trouble for the Israelis on three occasions by actually getting Hezbollah to run television-guided drones out over Israel. And in fact, one of them went straight away down the Mediterranean coast turned in over Gaza and headed for the nuclear plant in Devona before the Israelis shot it down. The Israelis claimed they were tracking it all the way and only shot it down when it's getting close to Devona. I'm not sure that's actually true because an earlier drone actually went to downtown Haifa and wasn't intercepted. These were unarmed, I should say. But in a sense, the phase we're in is the early development of a particular technology which can so easily proliferate. And there's not even any talk about any kind of arms control. So that, I think, is the first thing. The second thing is it raises all kinds of issues 
particularly when drones are being used for what are essentially targeted assassinations in sovereign countries. That will be true in Yemen, it will be true in Pakistan, it will probably be true in Sudan as well, and most likely it's going to be true in Mali too. Now, if you look at what you get out of the illegal people in the Pentagon, the view from the United States is if they see a named person in Yemen who they perceive to be a threat to the United States, they will argue that it is both ethical and legal to preempt action by that person, in other words, to target that person for assassination by a drone. If that is true, then obviously the same could be said to apply for Russia in Ukraine or Georgia, for China in Myanmar, uh, for Turkey in northeast Iraq, the Kurdish area of Iraq, uh, possibly even for Iran in Israel. In other words, what, if you like, is maybe acceptable to the United States, not easy to argue it is not acceptable to other countries. So in a sense, we're at the start of something new. And I understand there have been arguments in the Ministry of Defense about the status of the people who are actually piloting the drones. Now, if a young flight lieutenant uh, is operating the drone out of Waddington, <coughs> and then at the end of the shift, he, or indeed she, goes back to their family uh, off base somewhere in the southern part of Lincoln. Are they actually active military combatants who've just gone off duty? If so, are they, quote, legitimate targets? As would be the soldier in Camp Bastion who got off duty. It raises a whole load of very, very significant questions as nobody's really answering them. I suppose the point is that I think there are many different ways in which initially this whole idea of moving into an era of, quote, remote control is attractive and quite seductive. And in the short term, it may actually show some signs of appearing to work. I mean, again, from an American perspective, you actually have the view that all the drone attacks in Iraq have almost removed the middle level of leadership of the Al-Qaeda movement. And in fact, there's quite a lot of objective evidence that that is the case. But meanwhile, Al-Qaeda has changed out of, all, out of all recognition. It was never a narrow, narrow hierarchical movement. It is now much more of an idea, a very potent idea. Uh, there have been some very good articles this week, I think the last one is tomorrow morning, by Patrick Coburn in The Independent, which are actually tracking what's really happened to the Al-Qaeda movement. And as he points out, if you actually look at where it is now, it is actually a lot of other things. Highly active in Syria, even more active in Iraq, and in both countries actually holding territory. There is even some territory still held in Yemen. The Boko Haram movement in Nigeria is causing huge problems to the Nigerian government. You have the Caucasus Emirate in the southern Caucasus, and many, many other examples. You have the problems down the Swahili coast in East Africa. You have Somalia farther to the north. You have Yemen across the Red Sea. In other words, what Coburn is saying, I think anybody in the intelligence field would be forced to agree, the Al-Qaeda movement is now an idea which actually has more influence and more power than at any time since it was formed 20 years ago. And of course, we're now three to four years into the era of the armed drones, which supposedly have crippled the center of the movement. So it's not even clear that this process is even working now, let alone will work in the long term. So I suppose to finish off with, I just wanted to sort of try and open this up a little bit. And I suppose the three key things are, firstly, armed drones are causing a lot of controversy. That is very important, but they're one part of a wider thing. I think the second thing is there are all kinds of ethical and legal issues about them, and indeed the use of special forces, the night raids in Afghanistan, for example, uh, what the British were involved in in Iraq. And thirdly, we're moving into an era of proliferation here uh, with very difficult to foretell consequences. Overall, I think we need to be paying far more attention to what is happening. One very disappointing thing is that the Select Committee on Defense uh, last July announced it was going to do a study on armed drones, although they don't use that, that term. They have accepted that the Ministry of Defense's term is preferable, remotely piloted aerial systems. You don't call them armed drones because people don't like armed drones who change the name. It's rather like changing wind scale to Sellafield of about 30 years ago, the same sort of principle. What is extraordinary, though, is that the Defense Select Committee 
invited um, written evidence. And I put some in on behalf of the Remote Control Project, which is a project of the Network for Social Change, and uh, put the evidence in. And then we learned about uh, eight weeks ago that on this occasion for this study, the select committee decided not to call oral evidence. Now, as you know, select committees call oral evidence in almost every case, certainly anything that's publicly prominent. And oral evidence is very good because you get independent analysts questioned in public and televised. That is not happening with this study. I have no reason to know, but I suspect that the Ministry of Defence put as much pressure on it as it could on the select committee not to have oral evidence, because that would have enabled a number of people working in this field, including some very good campaigners, to actually argue in public uh, an indication of what is going on and perhaps the way in which armed drones form something even bigger, part of something bigger. So let me finish at that point so we've got plenty of time for discussion. We're into something which is different. I don't think too many people are putting it all together and seeing what's happening. And so it is going almost by default. And I think it's desperately important that that doesn't happen. And I don't no doubt the kind of work that Pugwash does is hugely important in making sure that this comes more out into the open. Thanks so much.